All right, let's begin in prayer this morning. Father, we come to you this morning. And we do have several requests I want to mention to you right now, Lord. We certainly pray for uh, Debbie Spiron. It may be the whole family, I'm not sure, but Debbie and, and her son, Lord, just uh, had a run-in this morning with something. We pray it wouldn't be uh, too, too much damage, Lord, perhaps stitches, perhaps not. And we just pray, Lord, that if it's your will, they would not have a long wait and be able to get treated, be okay. And give strength and grace under that time, Lord. And we pray for now for uh, Lionel and Barbara, Charlie, Lord, I believe driving them back to Uncanic. Pray for Miss Barbara. She just wasn't feeling well here, Lord. And some things there. I just pray for a safe trip home. I pray she'd be able to get some needed rest. Uh, you'd encourage her in the Lord. She'd be feeling a lot better, even maybe by the time she gets home. So give Charlie safety as they drive back. And Lord, we pray for Debbie, parent, and the family, children, Mike. Lord, we thank you they were able to get her in the hospital and, and monitor or do some tests. And I pray, Lord, today that as they maybe are making a determination of letting her go or doing some other things, that they would be able to, to know and narrow it down exactly what maybe was causing the challenges and the problems and the pain. That could be treated, Lord, and give needed rest, Lord, to all the family. Sometimes that wears you out, Lord, as you're at the hospital you're waiting up or early in the morning and we just pray again lord for wisdom and rest there today thank you lord for the privilege to be here together to assemble as believers to assemble together lord to worship you lord we know that even in much of the world lord though many things are tradition Lord, this is a time of year where many, many folks who would never darken the door of a church, never, Lord, maybe open their Bible, but because of tradition, because of Easter, because of all that goes on with that, Lord, will often be in church or watching during this time of year. Lord, we thank you for the wonderful privilege to preach the gospel, to share the truth of what happened, Lord, during this time of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. Lord, I pray that it would be fresh in our hearts. I pray it would never get old. And Lord, I pray it would transform our lives each day as we live as believers. And Lord, if there be any here today, in Sunday school. If there be any Lord watching today that, Lord, are not a child of God. They've never been born again. They've never been redeemed. Oh, Lord, I pray today they'd see the truth of the Bible, that they need to be saved. They need to have their sins forgiven, that they can be in God's family. Thank you, Lord, again for the privilege now to open your word during the Sunday school hour. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, in your Bibles, we're going to open to the Gospel of Matthew, Gospel of Matthew this morning, Matthew 16, and we're going to see how far we get. Now, I only have one page. That's it. I mean, look, nothing on the back. Didn't even bring my notebook. All right, just one page, but I don't know. We're going to get through that. We're going to see. We're just going to go right in the scriptures here this morning and uh, get our hearts and minds on Palm Sunday, triumphal entry, uh, days leading up to that. What was going on? What was going on with Christ? What was going on with his disciples? Uh, as things were getting closer to Calvary, the cross, did people know that? Now, what was going on? Christ mentioned it. Did the disciples, did they have a clue? Uh, did they miss things? What about Christ's teachings as he got closer to Calvary? Uh, did they change? What was he focused on? What about the religious leaders? What was all going on during those important days, week, leading up to Calvary? All right? If you read through the Gospels, I hope you will continue to do so. I would challenge you even this week. Even though you may be reading through the Old Testament right now, you may be doing your own reading, that's fine. I still would encourage you to add to that this week, especially reading through not necessarily all the Gospels. That might be a little too much, but especially maybe reading the last, depending on the book, Four, five, six, depends on what you can handle, chapters of each book as it leads to the betrayal, the crucifixion, the resurrection. Have those things fresh in your mind this week, all right? Don't just do it, maybe just read a quick chapter on Easter resurrection morning, but be reading, leading up to it as you begin to get the picture of what is taking place as Calvary looms for the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to pick it up in Matthew 16. Matthew 16. Let's read verse 21. Notice the wording. Matthew 16, verse 21. From that time forth. That's an important line. From that time forth. Now, what had he just done? Again, we, we could go way back. You could go back. What had just happened? He had just said, I will build my church. Looking ahead, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He had just given Peter a, a great responsibility that Peter was going to be the apostle that opened the doors with the keys, all right, uh, to the kingdom of the gospel. And you can see that fulfilled in the book of Acts. As Peter was the chief apostle there at Pentecost, 
preaching to the Jews. As Peter was the one going to Samaria after Philip. And wow, as Peter was the one with Cornelius and the Gentiles, Peter received the keys to open the door to the Gentiles in the book of, and the Jews, the gospel. And he just says all of that. Wow, what a great time. Peter's great declaration, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. As soon as that happens, verse 21, from that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem, unto Jerusalem, and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed. Whoa! That's the first time he's ever said that. And be killed, and be raised again the third day. I mean, that's pretty specific right there. Now, Christ has alluded to this previously, but he's never came out and declared it this specifically. He's talking to his disciples. Here's what is about to happen from this time forth. This begins to be one of his themes of his teachings. Myself, the Messiah, the Son of Man, we're going to go to Jerusalem. Well, Lord, you can't go to Jerusalem. They've been out for you for a long time. I mean, they already have posted if you know where he's at. We want to know. Reward. We want to arrest him. I mean, everybody, know, we're going to go to Jerusalem. We're, I'm going to Jerusalem. Not only am I going there, I will suffer many things from the religious leaders. And not only that, I will be killed. Now think, I want you to picture if you're one of the twelve. And be raised again the third day. Now look at verse 22. The same Peter who just a few verses before, right? Is not Peter just like you and I? Peter, just a few verses before, thou art the Christ. And he gets a special responsibility, honor. And now the same Peter speaks up when he hears this. Because that does not fit the mindset of the Messiah. Verse 22, then Peter took him, Jesus, and began to rebuke him. As if, as if he sort of said, Lord, I need to talk to you real quick. Pulls him to the side and is rebuking him, speaking strongly to Jesus about what he just said. Be it far from thee, Lord. This shall not be... You know what he's saying? No, Lord, no. No. I want you to stop talking like that. That is not going to happen. I'm not going to let that happen. It's not going to happen. Stop that. I mean, he rebukes the Lord Jesus Christ. And what happens here? You know the story, I think. Verse 23. But he turned, Jesus turned and said unto Peter. He rebukes Peter, but he's rebuking the spirit of Peter, which is the spirit of the devil. Get thee behind me, Satan. It's not saying Peter is Satan. He's saying, oh, my, that's, that's, you're speaking as the devil. That's what the devil, the devil doesn't want me to go to the cross. The devil wants, just like the temptations, the glory right now. The crown before the cross. Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me. For thou savorest not the things that be of God, those that be of men. Wow, I'll tell you what, a lot of lessons we could learn there. How many of us, we see ourselves with Peter? I mean, one moment, we, we, are, we might witness to someone and have courage and stand for God. The same day, hour or two later, we sin with our mouth, we fail God. and like, oh my goodness. Oh, wretched man that I am. I sort of was walking around, oh man, I just did a great thing. I stood for the truth, declared Christ. An hour later, I, I harmed the Lord's testimony of the way I spoke to my wife, my kids. Oh my God, the same thing happened to Peter right here in one little thing. The Lord Jesus is now beginning to declare what he, now he's alluded to it. Some of you may remember this. You could go back, we'll not go back to John, the book of John. In the temple, right, remember? Destroy this temple. What did he say? Right, okay. Now, that, that, was, that was vague. I mean, that was veiled. You and I know, we're looking back, and we say, oh, okay. We know exactly what he's talking about. He's talking about he's going to die, and his body, his temple, the body of the Lord, in three days is going to rise again. But, but no, they didn't really, no one understood what he was talking about. The Jews, the religious leaders, even his own disciples didn't understand that. And you go back to John 2, and it says they remembered that, they remember that after his resurrection. Oh, now we, now we know what he's talking about. 
You could go back to John 3, but he's speaking just to Nicodemus. Remember what he told Nicodemus? We all memorized John 3, 16, but what about 3, 15? As Moses... As Moses, going back to the book of Numbers, as Moses lifted that bronze serpent, look and live. And by the way, the brass serpent obviously is a picture of Christ because he said, who could look and live? What was that? Anybody. Anybody. Whosoever will. Whosoever will. Doesn't mean everybody did. Whosoever. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Now, he's alluding to the cross, but he's speaking just to Nicodemus. And no doubt Nicodemus did not necessarily know what he was talking about. Although I suppose he could have went home and meditated on that. As Moses lifted up the serpent, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Lifted up on a cross? Become a curse? So Christ has alluded to what would happen to him, but not as specific as he just said. John 6, 51, as he's talking about the bread, he talked about the fact that the Son of Man would be, he didn't say killed. But he, so you can go back and read in the Gospels, and you can see some things where Christ said some things that you and I say, oh, that's talking about, that's talking about the cross. But the first time he really has said it publicly to his disciples in great detail is right here. From that time forth, began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed. Now that was inconceivable to any Jew and their picture of the Messiah. No way! When the Messiah comes, he's the king. I mean, no one's going to overthrow him. He's going to come in and he's going to set up his kingdom. And he's going to rid Israel of the Romans or any other nation. And he will reign forever as the son of David, right? Certain prophecies you pick out and apply. Other ones in the Old Testament, well, I don't know. All right? No, Lord. And he rebukes him. No, Lord. Stop talking that way. I don't want to hear that. It's not going to happen. And the Lord rebukes Peter. Next chapter, chapter 17. Look at verse number 9. Matthew 17, 9. And as they came down, we're going to go back and look at this. And as they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them saying, tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. Now that's twice here, two times, Son of Man will be risen from the dead. He did say he would be killed, but he said twice now. Now who, who's he speaking to right here? You guys speaking to... All right, only three disciples now. It's not everybody. It's Peter, James, and John. We're going to talk about that in a minute. So Peter, James, and John were taken up to the top of the mountain to see the transfiguration of Christ as, as he really is, God, whoa, in all his glory. And he comes down, he says to those three, do not tell anyone <laughs> what you just saw until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. Now, what was their reaction? What would you say? Lord, tell us more about that. And, but they were focused a little bit on what had happened up there. It was just like you and I would be. All right? Now, I, I want to get off, not off track, but there's some fascinating things here. Sometimes we will read the Bible and we might say, you know, it always bothers me a little bit about, you know, Jesus and sort of like picking three disciples only. You know, like that's, isn't that showing favoritism? Like, no, this is only for Peter, James, and John. Not only Peter, James, and John. I mean, what made them more special? Sometimes we'll read that. And by the way, that's our sinful nature. That's, our, our, that's the way we look at things. We look at things through the Bible. Remember that. That's why we struggle with things in the Bible. Number one, we're not God. And we also are looking through the lens of as a sinner who has a deceived heart and we have the flesh. So anytime we read the Bible, remember, we're like, man, God sounds, that makes it look like he's a bully. That's not very loving. I don't know why he did that. Whoa. Let God be true and every man a liar. I can't, I mean, how, how, why is John the beloved disciple? I thought he loves everybody. You know, you're, you're, maybe you don't say it out loud, but. <laughs> I mean, how come, looks like John's his favorite. And how come Peter, James, and John? I mean, why is it just three? You know, and, and if you ever do that, and again, it's common to man, but if you ever, it begins to discolor your view of God, whoa, you better put on the brakes real quick. 
<laughs> you better say, Lord, forgive me. Whatever just popped in my mind is a wicked thought. It's not of you and of your word. I've got to cast that down because that discolors your character. That slanders God's character. That's really what Peter just did. No, Lord. So when you, when we do read the Bible, and we're looking at stuff, and it, sort of, and it, it, it slanders God's character that he's a good God, and a gracious God, and a holy God. That's one of those we need to, in a way, rebuke ourselves. Whoa, that's wrong. I, Lord, my thinking is wrong. It's wrong. I may not understand this, but it is wrong because you always are good. I just don't understand all that's going on here. But, but uh, just a quick side note on Peter, James, and John. If you were to go through the Gospels and, and ramp up your studying instead of just maybe reading, which is what we all need to do, and go back and actually look at the times where it was just Peter, James, and John, you're not going to find that many. All right? You're going to see this one here where he takes them up to the mountain. You're going to see him where he goes into the little girl's room. She's 12. Jerry is his daughter. It says, just Peter, James, and John. And he raises her from the dead. And then you're going to see one other time in the Garden of Gethsemane where they go into the garden as the disciples. But then it says he, he goes a little farther away and he asks Peter, James, and John to come a little farther. And then he himself goes even farther. So you have Christ, Peter, James, and John, and the other disciples minus Judas. And you're sometimes you're like, why does he do that? You know, if I was there, I would feel bad. I would feel bad. How come I'm not part of that group? I thought the Lord treats everybody equally. Well, God always does it right. God is always good. God's far above our thoughts and our ways. So why did Jesus do that? It's interesting. You could look on your own. I was reading on this a little bit, and I like what one pastor said. If you go back and look at the story of Jairus, his little girl, they're in the room, and they see Jesus say, Damsel, arise. That 12-year-old girl who was dead, had no pulse, was not breathing, got up. Showing Christ's victory over death, his power over death to these three disciples. Then, when you come here to Matthew 17, where they're taken to the Mount of Transfiguration, and they go up to the very top, and they don't even know what's going on. They're just up there, and all of a sudden, whoa, they look over, and there is Moses. <laughs> How did they know that was Moses, by the way? And there was Elijah. How did they know that was Elijah? Did they, did they have a picture book? Did they say, that's the way they've always looked. That's got to be Moses. I mean, it's got to be. Nobody else has hair and a beard. And a, that's <laughs> that's got to be Elijah. There is two Old Testament figures, we'd say giants, that are on the mountain talking to Jesus, and Jesus is in his glory. At, like, I mean, what we would see in heaven as God Almighty, they can't even look. Whoa! No, that was just Peter, James, and John. And when he comes down, he says, tell no man what you've just seen until after the Son of Man has risen from the dead. Now, the little girl that was risen, power over death. The transfiguration, Christ showing he will be glorified in his death. And then if you were to go to Matthew 26 in the garden, Christ surrendering to death. You say, well, what was that? But then think of those three men. What happened to James? First disciple martyred, Acts 12. What happened to Peter? Greatly persecuted and, as far as tradition, crucified. What happened to John? greatly persecuted, tried to kill him many times, banned to the island of Patmos. You think they forgot those three things? Suffering must come before glory. The cross always comes before the crown. We want the glory, we want the crown, we want the rewards, but it never works that way, it never is. Peter, James, and John, no doubt, never forgot those things. Oh, they probably didn't put all the pieces together. Christ is showing them some of the things they would even go through, but don't be discouraged. You remember. You may die. You will die. You will be persecuted greatly, but greater is he. Wow. They probably never forgot those things. By the way, there's so much we could get into here. Would you hold your spot right here and go over to Luke 9? Go over to Luke 9 just, just for a second.
Now, you might think the Sunday school hour is too long. I think it's too short. All right. It's like, oh, my goodness. The clock is always moving. All right. Go to Luke 9. Now, this is fascinating because you only read this in the book of Luke. The same story of going up to the mountain. Jesus, Peter, James, and John. But in Luke 9, look at the story. Pick it up in verse 28. Luke 9, 28. Luke 9, 28. Now, remember, this is all right before Calvary. And it came to pass about in eight days after these sayings, he took Peter and John and James and went up into a mountain to pray. And as he prayed... The fashion of his countenance was altered, and his raiment was white and glistering. And behold, there talked with him two men, which were Moses and Elias. That's another way of saying Elijah, who appeared in glory. But look at this. What were they talking about over there? And spake of his decease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. So you have Jesus, God, speaking in a little group. I've heard someone say one of the first Bible conferences is right here. All right? A little Bible conference. And you've got Moses and Elijah. And guess what they're talking about? Jesus' death and suffering. It's going to happen in Jerusalem. In fact, that word decease there is the word exodus. Isn't that interesting? They spake of his exodus, his departure. Now, why Moses? Oh, there's so much you can get into here. Why Moses and Elijah? Moses always represents the law. Elijah represents the prophets. Moses and the prophets. How many times have we looked at that as we were talking about Bible interpretation? Christ took Moses and the prophets. Moses and the prophets. Mo this, is, this is representing the law and the prophets. Moses, what did he do? Did he involved in any exodus? He led the children of Israel out of Egypt and out of what? Bondage and slavery. What about Elijah? Elijah, the prophet of God. What was happening when his great moment on the mountain with Mount Carmel? He led Israel out of idolatry, out of bondage. And now here they are talking to Jesus Christ up on the mountain about his decease and departure and death. And what's he going to do? Oh, far greater than they did. He will lead all mankind out of bondage from sin forever. Wow. Peter and James and John are observing. All right? No doubt. They didn't understand everything, but boy, they remembered it later, probably as they were suffering for Christ. Back to Matthew 17. Back to Matthew 17. All right. Let's pick it up a little later in the chapter. Boy, a lot, we're not hitting everything right at a time, rapid fire, but we're, we're, we're trying to get you up to a certain point. All these things are happening. Christ is beginning to talk about him dying, but he's never mentioned how, has he? He just said, I'll be killed. That can happen a lot of different ways. Look at Matthew 17, verse 22. And while they abode in Galilee, Jesus said unto them, The Son of Man shall be betrayed. Has he said that before? Shall be betrayed into the hands of men, and they shall kill him. And the third day, third day, he shall be raised again. Now, that's the third time he said the third day. And what was their reaction? And they were exceedingly sorry. Now, let's not get tough on these guys. Most of us don't like talking about that. We don't like talking about death. If you're in a conversation with somebody and they start talking about, now, I might die. And here's the funeral plans. You, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Most of us are like, I don't, want, I don't want to think about it. I don't want to hear that. Just stop. Stop talking about that. As if that's going to keep it from happening. We don't want to hear about suffering. We, 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 the most popular Christian fiction books are not on suffering and persecution. They're on, woo, look what happens. Everything turned out great. The, the, the movies, woo, look at the happy ending. Yea, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Christ starts talking about what's going to happen to him, and the disciples are either awkwardly ignoring it, don't know what to say, rebuking him, or they just all look at each other and they're very sorry. <laughs> but there's not really, they don't really want to think about it or discuss it or, you know how it is sometimes, stop. I don't want to, I don't like to talk about that kind of stuff. I don't want to think about it. But he's beginning to speak to them 
directly about these things. Let's jump ahead just a little bit. Go to chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20. Now please pay attention to the wording of Jesus here. Matthew chapter 20. Verse 17. Now, remember, he said we're going to Jerusalem, but notice the wording. And Jesus, going up to Jerusalem, took the twelve disciples apart in the way and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be betrayed under the chief priests and under the scribes. Now, he doesn't say how or who yet. And they shall condemn him to death. And shall deliver him to the Gentiles, Romans, to mock and to scourge and to crucify him. First time that's said. Now that is unimaginable to any Jew. There is no more horrific death, no more humiliating death than to be crucified by the Gentiles. Absolutely not. He just said that. We're going to Jerusalem. This is going to happen. I'm going to be betrayed. I will be delivered to the Gentiles. I will be condemned to die. I will be scourged like a common criminal. And they will crucify me and hang me on a tree. That's a curse. Remember that? The curse to be hung on a tree. But notice the ending. And the third day he shall rise again. Now, he has said that phrase four times. In <laughs> third day. Third day. Now, I know you and I look at this and say, hey, if I was part of that group, I'd be like, okay, third day I'm there. I'm ready. He said it. We know the story. We know that nobody was there. <laughs> well, there were some people there, but they were there to mourn and to decorate the body, and they weren't. Now, again, remember that he hasn't told everybody that. He's telling the disciples primarily. Hmm. Now, if you were to continue reading, what happens right after this? All right. (laughs) Here comes James and John's mother. And she's asking to request, could my boys be seated beside your throne in the kingdom? (laughs) And now, if you're the Lord, you (laughs) We're, we're going to the cross. We're talking about the Calvary. All right. Oh, by the way, a special request. Could, could, when you come to your kingdom, really, my boys are faithful. They're some of the first ones you chose. You've given them special things. Really, could you put them beside you in the kingdom? And, of course, the Lord answers that question. We don't have time to talk about it. But when word got back to the others, verse 24, and when the ten heard it, they were moved into, with indignation against the two brethren. Right? What are the disciples arguing about? Who's the greatest? Who's the greatest? How much time do we spend? Who's the greatest? Look what I've done. You're going to see they even are discussing this in the upper room. (laughs) Who's the best? Who's the greatest? Who did Jesus choose to do this? Who went up to the mountain? Who was one of his first disciples? Uh, Who did he ask to pray? You know, (laughs) they're they're arguing about who's the greatest, who's the most important to the Lord. They are not paying attention any bit about what the Lord is saying and what he is experiencing. And I'll tell you what, I see my, that's me, right? Right? I'm worried about me, my needs. Oh, I can come to church, all kind of people hurting, people discouraged, people missing. We even smile, say hi, but we don't really look at them. We don't look at their eyes. We don't notice those things many times. Some do, praise God. I hope many do. We're very keenly aware of our needs, our problems, our family, our finances, our health. And truth be told, it's, do do we have a lot of time for everybody else's baggage? Clock's ticking, conversations are going, we're not really listening, got to get moving. How often I do that, unlike the Lord Jesus Christ. The disciples have been told these things. They're really not listening. They're really not paying attention to it. They're really not wanting to even grasp it. That doesn't fit their picture of Jesus. That's not what they, they've seen tremendous things. They've seen people raised from the dead. They, they've seen Feeding of thousands, walking on water. They've said, wow, no, no, Lord, that's not going to happen. That's not how it's going to end. Christ is being very, very specific. Matthew 21. You should see where we're at here with the time. Matthew 21, verse 1. And when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem and were come to Bethage, 
unto the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus two disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you. Straight away you shall find an ass tied, and a colt with her, a foal, a baby, a younger one. Loose them and bring them unto me. And if any man say aught unto you, ye shall say, The Lord, the Master, hath need of them. And straightway he will send them. Apparently, perhaps, some followers of Christ. Hey, what do you got? What are you doing with those? Yeah. The Lord. Ma oh, absolutely. Verse 4. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye, this is quoting Zechariah, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. But not try meek, meek, sitting upon an ass, donkey, and a colt, the foal of an ass. That's meek. That's humiliating. That's not the second coming in Revelation 19 when he's coming on a white horse. King of kings and Lord of lords. This is the suffering Savior, the Messiah. Coming into Jerusalem, riding on a donkey. Verse 6, And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them and brought the ass and the colt and put them on their clothes. So you get a picture here. Christ is riding on the younger donkey, the colt. The mother is also there, maybe to the side or a little bit behind, being led along. They put some clothes or something on the, whore, the donkey for Christ to sit on. Have you ever ridden the donkey, anybody? You ever gone to like a fair? You've done some stuff like that? You go to a horse farm? I mean, sometimes they'll do that. Little, little kids will ride on them. I mean, that's, you know, if, if we showed a picture of you riding a donkey, most people would, <laughs> you know, or you go to Grand Canyon or some of those trips where you ride those, you know, I mean, you know, it's not glamorous. It's not like a big, majestic horse. You don't see a lot of donkeys in parades, do you? July 4th, you know, I mean, you know, oh, donkeys are stubborn. They're, you know, I mean, a horse, majestic. And Christ is riding, meek, a colt. Verse 8, and a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Now, if you were to go back and read all the Gospels, you would know what has happened previous to this. Christ has just performed, not long, perhaps you and I would say his greatest miracle. I mean, they're all great. The raising of Lazarus. Wow. John 11, Lazarus come forth. Whoa. I mean, that shook up the city. I mean, this wasn't just a little girl that maybe you could say, well, maybe she really wasn't dead. Or the young man that was done in an obscure village up in Galilee as they were having the funeral, maybe the same day. This was someone who's dead and has been buried for four days, Lazarus. This is someone whose body stinks. This is, there is no way you can explain that any other way. Lazarus is, and the Bible says many believed on him. Many went and told the chief priests and leaders, and they said, what are we going to do? Everybody believes on him. This is, we're going to have to kill, we're going to, whoa. Now this is right after that. You go to John 12, he comes to Bethany, Mary anoints him, and it's the triumphal entry. So Christ, there's a lot of people that know what Christ has done. There's a lot of people that know what he has been doing, and there is a large crowd here. And they spread their garments in the way. And they put down the branches and the palm branches. And they, they make almost like a procession for a, a king, if you would. Verse 9, and the multitudes that went before, and by the way, there would have been millions in Jerusalem because this is the beginning of the feast week. People, Jews are coming from all around the world for the Passover. This is the week you're getting things ready for the Passover. It, 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 go back and read the other Gospels. You'll see where he, he's going to, well, he's going to cleanse the temple because everyone's buying and selling and bartering and getting lambs. And I mean, Jerusalem is swelled in population. And verse 9 says, the multitudes that went before and that followed. Now, I don't know much about these multitudes. Many people just get caught up in emotion. If you were out there and you're just in town, you're like, what's going on? Oh, Hosanna. You might jump in as well. You might not even know who that man is riding that donkey. You might, oh, that's Jesus. You might just be like, oh, awesome. Yeah, everybody else is. You might believe what you're saying. But you could just simply be, yeah, everybody else is having a great time. Let's go. There's massive crowds and, and they're following him and they're saying, Hosanna. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Now, maybe the disciples started that. 
Uh, maybe there were other followers. Maybe everybody was sincere. We're not here to decide that. But there is a large crowd, and they are giving some Bible prophecy. Hosanna. Does anybody know what that means? Maybe you have a study Bible. We sing sometimes Hosanna. Sometimes we don't always remember what that means. That means save now. Save now. You know, save. Yes. Hosanna to the king. Yes. You know, it almost is like a, a king is coming, and everybody in the crowds, and of course it gets to the religious leader. What's going on here? All right. Verse 10. But notice the reaction to most people, verse 10. And when he was coming to Jerusalem, all the city was moved saying, who is this? So it, it was sort of a false triumphal entry. Yes, it looks majestic, but he's fulfilling prophecy, riding a donkey, meek and mild, getting ready to go to the cross. Most people, hey, who is that? Who's that? Who's that? What are we doing? Verse 11, notice what most people said. This is Jesus, the prophet. Prophet. This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth. Well, no, he was not just a prophet from Nazareth. So just because there were a large crowd, just because everybody was excited, just because you were saying the right things, what's going to happen less than a week later to those same multitudes? What are those same multitudes going to say? Crucify him. You better be careful how fickle the crowd is. Not one, we don't have anybody speaking up less than a week later. What do I do with this man? Crucify him. Crucify him. Now, it doesn't mean everybody said that. The same group here. Woohoo! Crucify him. This is go with the crowd. There's a lot of believers, a lot of unbelievers. That's exactly how they, they just go with everybody. Everybody's at church, they're at church. Nobody's at church, they don't come to church. It's very chameleon, you know. Everybody's pumped up. Woo, I'm pumped up. Uh, nobody there, huh? And we just, we just fluctuate with what the crowd does. We just go with the flow. If, if everybody's doing right, we'll do right. If everybody does wrong, we'll do wrong. If we're at someone's house and watching a good show, we'll enjoy it. We go to someone's house watching a bad show, we watch it. I mean, it's like, what in the world? Who are you? I mean, we just, wow, we just do, go, go with the crowd, go with the flow. And here's the crowd. Yeah, hey, it's a prophet. Okay, great. And what happens in verse 12? Jesus went into the temple. Now, remember, this happened two times. One at the beginning of his ministry, John 2, right here at the end. Similar story, goes in and sees all the proselyting, the gain, just like a big market. You can read that on your own, go back and see that. Verse 15, and when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying in the temple, and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were sore, displeased. Oh, oh what's going on here? This is dangerous. Is he going to try to start something? We're going to, oh, you know, you can go back and read the triumphal entry. We have just a few minutes. Let's go to Matthew 21. You're in Matthew 21. We're already here. I wanted to get to this. I'm almost at the end of my page. We're not going to quite get to it, but I want to quick introduce this. Maybe you can study this on your own this week. Verse 18. Now in the morning, as he returned into the city, he hungered. And when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing thereon but leaves only and said unto it, Let no fruit grow on thee henceforth forever. And presently the fig tree withered away. Now, we can stop here. Some people say, oh, I can't believe Jesus did that. That's so mean. That's so... <laughs> now, my, we were just down in, in Shelby. My father-in-law has a fig bush. He likes figs. All right? He transplanted from his home he grew up in. So they weren't blooming yet, but he has a, a lot of figs. So if you've ever eaten those. All right? So fig trees, typically, the fruit normally comes before all the leaves. So when you see the leaves, you should assume there's fruit, or there's fruit, leaves, and then there's fruit, etc. Christ looks like he's just doing something rationally. He got upset. Ah, cursed be the tree. But if you understand the Bible here, if you understand what he's doing here, and we don't have time to read into all of it, too. In the Bible, fig tree is almost always a picture of Israel. You go back and read it in Jeremiah, you'll see it in Hosea. You'll see Israel's pictured as a fig tree. All right? Christ comes to the fig tree, and it's, it's a picture of the nation of Israel. Israel has leaves, but no fruit. Looks good outwardly, but there's nothing there. It's a false outward show. The nation of Israel, he's, he's giving judgment of what's happening to the nation. Israel has rejected the king. Israel has rejected the truth and the prophets. The nation of Israel is going to be judged. No fruit. Now, he, he comes back to that because if you can read the other Gospels. The disciples have some questions about the fig tree and all of that. And so I'm just going to introduce this. I'd love for you to study this on your own. Christ does three parables in a row. Remember parables? Oftentimes, they are all, all tied together. 
And he gives three parables here leading up to the cross. Verse 28, and again, many people do not properly interpret these parables. You just pull them out. All right, he gives the parable of the two sons. You probably use this, parents. Father asks the one son to do something. The son says, absolutely, I'll do it, Dad, but then he doesn't do it. second son says, no way, but then he changes and does it. Now, you can certainly make some loose application there, but let's make sure we understand what he's talking about. <laughs> they, he, verse 31, he says, okay, now here's my parable. Now, whither of them twain, which of the two sons did the will of his father? They say unto him, well, the first one, Jesus saith unto them, verily I say unto you. He's giving the point of the parable, that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. Now, he's talking to the crowd here, religious leader. Whoa. Verse 32, for John, John the Baptist, came unto you in the way of righteousness, and ye believed him not. But the publicans and the harlots believed him. And ye, when ye had seen it, repented not afterward that ye might believe him. Whoa. That's pretty powerful there. You know what he's saying? You have rejected God the Father because God the Father sent John the Baptist. He gives his next parable, verse 33. Here's another parable. And by the way, both of them had to do with a vineyard. Verse 28, the father had a vineyard. Vineyard is always a picture of Israel. Verse 33, another parable. Householder had a vineyard. He hedged it round about, digged a wine press, built a tower. He leased it out to his country. Verse 34, when the time of the fruit drew near. Notice, time of the fruit, he sent his servants to the husbandman. Verse 34, the husband took his servants and beat one, killed another, stoned another. Those represent the prophets God sent. Again, he sent another servant more than the first, and they did more. Verse 37, I'm paraphrasing. But last of all, he sent unto them his son, saying, they will reverence my son. But when the husband saw the son, they said unto themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him. Let us seize on his inheritance. And they caught him, cast him out of the vineyard, and slew him. When the Lord, therefore, of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto those husbandmen? They answered, well, he will miserably destroy those wicked men. He will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits of their seasons. And you know what he says? Wow, verse 43. Therefore say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you, Israel, and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof, the Gentiles. You have rejected the father. You have also rejected the son. And then he gives the third one. We don't have time to get to it. Verse chapter 22, he gives a third parable. They all tied together. By the way, this parable is looking ahead a little bit after his resurrection. You can, it's a fascinating parable. Sometimes we like the story of it there, but this is talking about God's merciful. He gives the Jews one final chance in the book of Acts. Who does the gospel go to first? The Jews. Who responds to the Jews? But eventually, what do they do in Acts 7? They stone Stephen. And what does Stephen say to them? How long do you resist the Holy Ghost? They resisted the Holy Spirit. Judgment. What happens the rest of Acts? Gentiles. Whole rest of the book of Acts. It's all Gentiles. Israel, you have rejected the king. Judgment is coming. That happened in AD 70. Rome, Titus came in, destroyed Israel, the walls, the temple, burned with fire. Wow. Christ heading to the cross. And that brings us to the upper room, which we don't have time for. It is 1015. Our time is finished. Hopefully we got a little bit there to whet your curiosity, give you some things to study, rejoice in the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did for us. We'll continue that in the morning message. All right, we'll see. You got 15 minutes?